so much, uh, Taylor. Thank you. I just want to congratulate Chloe again. What an extraordinary speech. She's made my speech completely irrelevant. I'm not happy about that, but uh, uh, wonderful remarks, Chloe. And congratulations to the class of 2023, to the honorary degree recipients. It is an honor to be on this stage with each and every one of you. Uh, you have uh, reminded us of what's best in humanity, what's best in scholarship, what's best in education, and what's best in service. And the class here and all the parents and families were all so lucky to be with you. President Randall, thank you for having me. Trustees, faculty, staff, parents, Governor Cox, thank you for being here. Congratulations, class of 2023. I know, thank you, yes, congratulations. I'm, I'm guessing uh, that many of you did not expect to see me here tonight. Uh, I was born in Boston. I haven't attended the U, although I got the sign. I was raised in democratic politics, and uh, people can win elections here in the state of Utah by using my name and opposing it. So. I keep wondering, did someone make a mistake? Did I, get, uh, did I get a call? And then I thought maybe this was a joke and it's all very intimidating, but my Irish roots are a little helpful when you're intimidated. So I called a friend of mine and he said, Tim, don't be intimidated. The graduation speaker is like the corpse at an Irish wake. <laughs> you need him to have a party, but you don't expect much from him. <laughs> Okay, so there's low expectations of me, but there are really, really high expectations of this class of 23. And I'm grateful that you've taken a chance on me. I'm gonna begin by quoting something that may sound a little bit familiar. Love your enemies and bless those that curse you. Now I know what you're thinking. That's really difficult, no one can do that, but that's not true. Your parents were practicing do good to those that curse you the whole time you were teenagers. <laughs> parents, can I, have, can I hear an amen on that? <laughs> You'll do the same when you have teenagers of your own. It's not only possible to do this, it's actually essential. It's actually how we survive. You know, I want you to say when this is done, mom and dad, thank you for blessing me when I called you and all I wanted was money. And then go buy an early Mother's Day present for your mother or for anyone who mothers you. And that doesn't have to be only your mom because the mom is the person who never stops believing in you. That's what it means to mother. So on this Mother's Day, shower your parents, your moms with gifts, but share them also with the rest of those who have always taken a chance on you. So my message tonight is that taking a chance is really, really serious business. I grew up with parents who took big chances. My mom took enormous ones. She grew up with a sister named Rosemary who had intellectual disabilities. When she was just a little girl, my mom would see her mother on the phone calling around, asking for help, teachers, mentors, doctors. And my grandmother would put the phone down and she would say, there's nothing for Rosemary. Nothing, nothing, nothing. My mom and my grandparents, they could have given up. That's just how the world is, they might have said. But that wasn't the way the world should be. And so my mom learned to see what others didn't. The world saw Rosemary as too different to be included. My mom saw a sister who was too beautiful to be excluded. And that made all the difference. A generation later, my mom heard parents say to her the same thing she'd heard her mother say. There's nothing from my son. There's nothing from my daughter. And my mom said, yes, there is. Bring your children to my house, and I'll take it from there. 
And so my mom invited not only children with intellectual disabilities to our house in the summer, but all kinds of young people, young people from high schools and colleges, and she asked them to volunteer in what she would call Camp Shriver. Come to my house, she said, I'll teach you to swim, I'll teach you to play, I'll teach you to see the joy and the beauty you've been missing. That's how it started. Moms and dads, campers and volunteers, taking a chance. A few years later, Camp Shriver became Special Olympics. And thousands and then millions of kids came to play. And for countless parents, it was, and I'm sad to say, remains often the first time they're invited to be proud of their children. And for so many volunteers, it's the first time they're able to see the beauty in each person clearly. And that, my friends, my graduate friends, is a revolution. When my mom was at the end of her life, she was still restless, and I said to her, Mom, you should write a book. She said, no one would read my book. All I ever did was teach children with intellectual disabilities to swim. She did more than teach children to swim. She taught people how to see. Over the last 25 years, I've been part of this joyful movement we call Special Olympics, and I wish I could give you a full picture of all the, the bravery and the grit and the courage and the beauty I've been privileged to see. But just imagine with me for a minute, imagine Malachi running his 100 meters on a dirt track uh, and his mom cheering for him with her, his hands raised up at the end of that 100 meters in a destitute refugee camp in Central Africa. Imagine a, a kid running into a stadium at the end of a 10K, the last to finish, but the few sparsely uh, populated crowd all cheering for him as he came across the finish line and seeing his dad standing on the sidelines with tears streaming down his face. He was as proud as if he'd won an Olympic medal, and he did. And imagine seeing Donald Page and a person who's from his early childhood can't walk and doesn't have speech and being invited to perform in front of almost this many people, 3,000 people in Dublin, even the president of the country. And what was he there to do? To lift a beanbag and move it 18 inches. Imagine being able to watch him bring the crowd to its feet, see the cheers, watch as he for 18 extraordinary minutes did what no one thought he could do, which was lift that beanbag and move it across that tray. These champions are not telling you what to see, but how to see. Not to see the others we so often fear, but to just see bravery and love trying to set us free. There are five million Special Olympics athletes like them around the world, and many here in Utah. I'm so grateful to the First Lady, to Abby Cox, for her championing their efforts to create inclusive sports in schools all across this great state. So graduates, I don't come here to ask you to have faith in human dignity. I don't come here because I have some deep belief in it. I don't come here because I have a theory about it. I come here because I've seen it. I know it exists. Dignity is God's gift to the human family, and it's what makes us a family too. We're immensely diverse. Look around you, you see engineers and pre-med and scholars of the arts and sciences, all kinds of different people. Uh, but in the things that we most deeply need and want, in the love that gives our lives meaning, in the purpose that brings us happiness, in the, in, the, in the contentment and belonging that we all hunger for, there's not an atom of difference between us. We are all the same in that which matters most. And we only get what matters most from the faith we receive in the depths of our souls and from the tenderness we receive from each other. Now today in our country, there are thousands and thousands of voices. Instead of offering dignity, they're offering the idea that you should treat others with contempt. Across the land, you are graduating and entering the workforce and adult life in a time 
when fear actually threatens to destroy the country. It's not just fear generally, it's fear that we can't solve our problems. There's probably people here tonight who have maybe even given up on the idea that Americans can solve our problems. We think we can't work with those people to solve our problems because those people are the problem. Class of 23, that's fear talking. That's not the best in you talking. Those people are never the problem. Fear that turns into contempt, that's the problem. So sure, contempt can make you rich. Contempt can get you elected. Contempt can make you powerful, can give you false friends and clicks and lots of likes. Yeah, it works, but it doesn't solve our problems. Nothing is less faithful, faithful than treating other people with hate. Nothing is less practical than humiliating others, and nothing is less American than hating your fellow Americans. It's a scourge in our land. Contempt doesn't ease divisions. It doesn't prevent violence. It doesn't solve problems. So I'm here to ask you, to beg you, as you go forward from here, don't listen to the voices that are telling you to blame and shame and treat others with contempt. Turn them off, tune them out, shut them down. You can do it. It's a very simple action. Everybody has the power to create a new kind of incentive that doesn't reward hatred and contempt, but instead rewards dignity. So, so over the last, as Taylor said, over the last few years, we put together a team and we tried to bridge gaps and bring people from all parties and races and backgrounds and all the different identities that split us apart. Let's get together and come up with good ideas. And we came up with this crazy idea, a Dignity Index. It's an eight-point scale and it allows you to test whether how you treat others when you disagree. When I disagree with you, how do I characterize you, the other? The Dignity Index is above all a vote of confidence in us because it assumes that if you see the dignity option and you see the contempt in yourself or in others, you'll choose, you will choose to choose more dignity. That's the premise. It's a big take a chance message. And if lots of people do that, then we don't just have individuals making a difference, we have a movement. So last summer, I came here to the University of Utah with my colleagues Tom Rosher, a former speechwriter, and Tammy Pfeiffer, a former elected official. Tammy, will you stand because you have been the extraordinary mover and shaker behind all of this work. And we went to meet with President Randall and we started talking, not this long, but almost this long, and about two or three minutes into the conversation, he got up, stepped out of the room, made a phone call, and within 24 hours, Professor Jesse Graham was on board, the Kemp C. Gardner Policy Institute was on board, the Hinckley Institute of Politics was on board. We had a crew of students, many of them are here tonight, willing to test, validate, scrutinize the index, to determine whether it worked, and they all agreed to take a chance. Why? Because we're starving for an alternative to the way in which our culture is treating us right now. And with the resources and the reputation and the expertise of this great university, not of a hundred different universities, of this university, of the you, right? Is that right? <laughs> okay, forget that. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I haven't read time, for goodness sakes. So we launched a demonstration project and we scored the last midterm election, the congressional races, the Senate races, and it was extraordinary. Columnists, talk show hosts, social media influencers, they all started asking a new question. Is that candidate speaking with contempt or is that candidate speaking with dignity? 
Amanda Ripley came out here and wrote a 6,000 word piece. Pollsters started commenting, this is long overdue in our culture. I think Governor Cox agrees because he's launched his entire National Governors Association leadership initiative around healthy conflict. But the greatest impact wasn't what we thought it would be. It wasn't that we could judge politicians. It was that people started to use it themselves. We call it the mirror effect. You think you're going to judge someone else, and all of a sudden, you start to hear your own voice. You start to hear the way you spoke last night to your brother or your sister, your husband or your wife, your mom or your dad, your professor. And all of a sudden, you start to think, maybe I shouldn't be talking that way. Maybe I should take down that post I put up yesterday. Maybe I should remove that comment from my feed. The Dignity Index relies on one of the most ancient tools for social change in the history of human beings, President Randall said, conscience. This country has a conscience. We each have a conscience. It's time to awaken it. So the movement is on. Right here at the university, we now have a new club. It's called Students for Dignity ready to score next fall when people come back to campus. Those of you who are alumni, soon to be official alumni, can come back and visit some of the activities that Students for Dignity will hold. We're hoping dozens of universities will follow the lead of Students for Dignity right here at the university. Yeah, let's give it, let's give it. If you worked on the index, stand up. Come on, stand up. I want you to see these extraordinary young people. Thank you for being here, yeah. So really, all you, all you all are doing is paraphrasing the great sermon for contemporary moments. You've heard it said that the news, on news and in social media, fight for your beliefs by demeaning and destroying the other side. But here at the U, we say fight for your beliefs and treat others with dignity at the same time. So, I know, I know that uh, there are many pundits who want to predict the next election, but I'm predicting something else. I'm predicting that when all of you come back for your fifth reunion and celebrate the big gifts they'll give to the university uh, and all the, all the memories you'll be rekindling, I bet when you come back for your fifth reunion, there'll be people around the country who are talking about the Dignity Index and Students for Dignity and the Dignity Movement. I am absolutely putting all my money, I don't know whether there's a gambling service that allows for that, but by the time you come back for your 10th reunion, here's the gamble. You will have changed the social and political culture of our country. You will have changed in 10 years, I am convinced of it, that people will take a chance because they're starving to do so. Now, I know Sometimes it seems scary to take a chance on high ideals and deep experience. But all the noise and all the hostility around us can't hide the simple truth. Within each of us, there is that fragile spark of love. There's a gentle tug toward what is good. There's a hunger and a search for what is beautiful. You will spend your whole life, I dare say, hoping you can trust that spark to bring you happiness and purpose and fulfillment. The good news is you can't lose it. The bad news is you didn't earn it. It's just a gift. It's been given to each of us. And as faint as that spark may sometimes seem, it's what makes life worth living. If you want to look to the stars, draw and see the extraordinary, awesome wonder of the universe and feel that spark within you as you melt into the wonder. Look to the saints of history or to the saints of your lives and feel the spark draw you towards the beauty of self-sacrificing love. Look to the poets, look to the artists, and feel that spark turn into a flame when you feel in the presence of beauty. 
If you can, remember the athletes of Special Olympics. Remember your moms. Remember the search for truth at this great university, that hunger. These are all experiences that you know already are tapping into the heartbeat that's within you that knows the universe is on your side. Despite everything, and you've seen a lot in your short lives, despite everything, life is good. Life is beautiful. We are all a spark, brief, bright, and beautiful. The greatest wonder of them all is you and everyone else too. So I ask you, fellow graduates, to take a chance on others. Take a chance on dignity. Don't give up. In this time, division is the biggest challenge facing our country. There are many others, but that one is bigger than all of them. And you are on the side of solving this problem with a practical, meaningful, impactful strategy. It's a solution steeped in the faith that honoring each other is a patriotic duty. There is no America without democracy. There is no democracy without healthy debate, and there is no healthy debate without dignity. This is the foundation of a new politics, and I hope many of you will enter public life. But whatever life you enter into, this is a new kind of patriotism. All we need, all we need are enough leaders willing to take a chance, rebels, outliers, political outlaws willing to declare their independence of the, and overthrow the culture of contempt for the sake of our country. That's you. That's all of us. That's the time for a change. You get this, Utes. <laughs> take a chance on you. Take a chance on us. Take a chance on dignity. Congratulations, class of 2023, and thank you. Take a chance. Thank you, Tim, for your empowering words and thoughtful uh, advice for, for each of us. This is a moment uh, to remember. When questions and choices arise in the future, take a chance on hope, take a chance on kindness, take a chance on dignity. Um, my interactions with Tim and the students that have been piloting this Dignity Index have been quite simply remarkable. This is something, a value we should bring to our campus something that will change, I believe, the future of our education, the way we learn, the way we talk to each other. So Tim, thank you very much. Would you give him a hand one more time? <laughs>